Good evening to all of you. To the office bearers of the Institute and to all the members, thank you very much for having me here. If your president doesn't, president, right? Chen. 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 Doesn't mistake me, I'd like to certainly put this forward. Initially, I think the organizers wanted me just for an interaction with you. He's had a change of mind. He says, come address my people. So I address you. Uh, no, no, you don't have to apologize. I'm just saying, for good or bad, he wants me to address you. See, I'll take it from uh, the way Honorable Prime Minister spoke to you all. Was it in 2019? 17, is it? When uh, he addressed all over the country, chartered accountants, reminding and drawing a parallel with the freedom movement, where at that time, during the freedom movement, a lot of lawyers had left their profession gave up very lucrative professions and fought for the political freedom of India. And I distinctly remember Honorable Prime Minister saying, it is now the time marking 75th anniversary of India, which was getting closer then, that the chartered accountants, you don't have to give your life or you don't have to you know, give up your profession, but you have a very big role in building the economic strength of India. That was the larger message that uh, the Prime Minister wanted to give, and that stands very relevant even today. More relevant today because he's also set this very clear target, and I'm not saying ambitious, a very clear target of Vikasit Bharat by 2047. I didn't say ambitious because I think it is achievable. It is well within uh, the power and the ability of Indians who have seen once in a century pandemic, a complete lockdown for three months, post that a partial lockdown, each state had its own partly opening, partly not opening, some areas getting locked down and the rest of the state being open. So thorough disruption moratorium for companies so that they don't go into liquidation, extension of specially uh, sovereign guaranteed loans, and you were keeping the books balanced even in this kind of a disruptive environment. And post that you're also seeing your own clients recovering from their difficulties. You're giving them advice about how the opening up actually is seeing a lot of newer developments, the kind of reforms which the government has taken, ease of doing business, which is now benefiting most sectors. And people are realizing that life can be simpler than what it was earlier. Like chartered accountants, for instance, I'm sure your headache about your clients income tax details. Not that your client is not wanting to give details, not that you don't want to do a fair job of it. But when pre-filled forms come from the board, the CBDT, you breathe a sense of relief and your client also says, oh my God, yes, I did forget this one. Yes, it has to be included. Or he says, no, no, no this is not mine. Please go back and check it up. So there is a lot of trust coming in in this whole exercise, where the government trusts taxpayers, wants to take them on board to say, look, this is what we are finding in our system, something which pertains to you, a fixed deposit which you've forgotten. You got transferred from one place A to place B. You left your deposit there and you didn't include it. Would you want to include it? You realize not just for tax purpose, even your money, you want to go and pick it up. So like that, once these kind of technology driven, trust enriching 
steps which are being taken by the government, you as a professional realize that technology is doing good to you and to the client. Of course, it is doing good to the government. So, the, as we progress with the core essentials of chartered accountancy, you also realize competency in technology-driven keeping of accounts is now becoming more essential. Because it gives you an advantage. You can't be laid back to say, no, I am keeping the books, balance, somebody will look at the account. It is actually being tailored for every individual to file his return on his own. And for small businesses, in fact, I remember the first year of my becoming finance ministry, part of the finance ministry, there was thorough hatred. My God, your profession would want to be chopping my neck off. I didn't mind, because I can understand. We wanted the small companies to be free to do their own, because the technology is there for you to fill up your own. And if the government was to give the message, that we believe in you, you file your tax returns, you don't need to be certifying, uh, a chartered accountant need not be certifying your accounts. It made their life simple. It wasn't to deny anybody their professional earning. It does bring in a lot of sense of ease for a very small business. Because everything that you, in your professional knowledge would tell him, do this and not do that. If you do this, there's an advantage. If you do that, you, there's not so much of it. It's all now being done by technology. Of course, it can't be for medium-sized or large companies. The complications, the layers, the calibration, the more studied way of handling it, where you can be advised to plan your portfolios in such a way that you have better savings, there, of course, it is essential. So like that, technology was used to bring in greater ease for both the SSC and for the professionals who are advising their clients. And so is it with GST. Now with the tribunals getting formed, I'm sure many of your little doubts, disputes, all will get solved in each of the states at the state level itself. And once you get used to it with a couple of cases, you're able to, you're going to be able to fine tune it to perform even better. With the experience, you're able to tell the government saying, do you want to do it this way? Do you want to do that way? And improve the system because system works for both the parties. In this case, it works for three. And therefore, the approach government of India has taken is to expect from chartered accountants to enable and to help in greater formalization of the Indian economy. We need more people to get onto the system. You can't remain in the shadow of the system, flourish there, but have occasional interaction with those who are in the formal system itself. So you can't really be surviving only being out of the system and functioning saying, I have nothing to do with the taxation, I'm too small, I'll remain out of taxation, I, I can continue with that. You can continue like that, nobody's stopping you, there's no force. But the benefits you, your business and the Indian economy can re uh, reap will be very limited. So the more you are able to interact with businesses which are small and who still remain in the informal, there is a need to build awareness to say, don't fear getting on to the formal system, because the normal fear is once I come there, I'll have to pay tax. It's not just for paying tax. You may end up not paying tax at all, even after coming on to the formal. You're coming on because you can reap the benefit of this open big world into which a lot of people are coming on board. Look what the digital payments have done. People didn't fear, if I get in there, I may end up paying tax. No. Why? Because they knew the transaction ease, the speed, and the access to newer markets are all doing good for his business. Why is that not happening, let us say, among small businesses? 
you need a digital revolution even in that, in that, in that area. Because the sense of fear that people have got built in their heads about, oh, this will mean that I'll have to sub submit an account every year, file my returns every year. It means I'm opening my systems up so that taxman is going to be after me. That is the fear which has to go out of people's minds. Because the benefit that you reap once you come onto the formal system is far more than what you can account for now. So that is one thing I would certainly uh, elaborate, drawing from what Prime Minister spoke to you all. And that is absolutely now critical because if by 2047 we want to leave an India for our future generations, for our children, for our grandchildren, to be happy and proud to live here. Today, people are going out for jobs. It is probably the reverse migration has started in the global sense. A lot of people are finding businesses, professions, career to be built in India, who have a global footprint as well. I would think that is a very good beginning to make, but by 2047, ideally, India should be a country which is worth for our grandchildren to stay and live and lead their lives and contribute to the country rather than run away from here because opportunities, job satisfaction, career enhancement are better there and not here. That is where I think you have a very big role to play, not just with the, your profession, but also with your clients. Periodically also inform them about the improvements which are happening in the system, not just use of technology, but also the way in which professions are widening, the opportunities that are coming before us, I'm very glad to hear a lot of interest being shown about the International Financial Services Center Gift City, even when I was seated downstairs and also in the earlier gathering, there's a lot of interest about IFSC, especially after chartered accountancy and financial services have all gone on to become part of the portfolio that Gift City would handle. And something which I said in Gujarat the day before yesterday, I think it was also a gathering of chartered accountants. I did tell them that the gift city is envisaged to be not an Indian territory, but a territory located in India, like an SCZ, Special Economic Zone, for financial purposes. Of course, it does now ship leasing, aircrafts, maintenance, repair, and so on, but many others as well. It is a territory located in India, but with all the global financial best practices in there. So the front door of, exactly this is what I told in Gujarat, the front door of IFSC is opened for all global operators in fintech, in banking, in bullion exchange, in stock operations, and insurance, also in uh, ship leasing, also now fintech, inclusive of accountancy, insurance, and so on. The front door is open so that the global investors, global banks, global insurance companies, leasing companies can all come to India. But having located such an international financial services center in India, and inviting all these to come, the front door kept open with all kinds of legislative and regulative uh, practices simplified. One window regulation, you're not going to Eridai separately, NAFRA separately, RBI separately, and so on, SEBI separately, and so on. All of them are together there in one entity. Now, if that has been done, it's with an intention that that will legitimately send benefits to India. So I used an expression, if the front door is open for investors, operators, banks to come in there, global banks to come in there, global insurance to come in there, the back door, not the proverbial negative back door, 
but the other back door which is inward opening should send the benefits of all these operations for india so it's not as if it's a door through which indian businesses go out, uh, outside it's not a door through which indian professionals go outside it is a global financial hub which will draw the global best of institutions there so that india also can benefit from it those best practices should give the necessary collateral benefit for us so as opening statement i leave it there but i'm sure there's a lot more to talk about how government of india has been very actively engaging with several countries for mutual recognition so that chartered accountants from india are recognized as professionals in other countries as well but before i say this one other thing which like the prefilled form comes for the tax assessee i want to say there has been a very enthusiastic forward movement in the advanced pricing agreements that we are doing so at least global trade doesn't have to be worried about what what implication tax tax implication they have to bear now i think nearly 14 or 15 of them already have been signed so these are practices through which companies are able to have certainty in taxation as a result of which doing in uh, in india taxation government policy can all be on a firm predictable stable footing as opposed to a time when we went back to doing retrospective tax much to the dislike of the global community and for indians themselves because it sends a kind of fear saying how backward would you go so prime minister modi and the government have been very progressive future looking the mutual agreements or the advanced uh, pricing are all going to help in uh, the simplification of the tax assessee's approach towards taxation so i'll stop here of course if there's anything more you can always talk thank you thank you ma'am while it was not in the agenda you uh, paid the attention to our heed and addressed us thank you so much yeah it's now time for the interactive session where members can ask uh, the questions ma'am before i open the floor for the questions i had a question on i mean general question to you saying while india has performed and all the statistics say, say that the indian economy has grown over the last decade but still economists from india only claim that india has not performed in the last 10 years and poor have become poorer what is your response to that are you a are you doing a journalist business here or are you no 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 i am a chartered no, accountant you are welcome to do it yeah <laughs> see poverty you particularly spoke about in did you use the word poverty you didn't poor poor have become a poorer poor have become poorer i'd like people who say that to show me the statistics for it whereas the statistics with government of india says which is also concurred by uh, uh, world bank and imf and uh, global observers is that despite covid and because of the measures taken by the government they say this because of measures taken by the government people have been saved from getting into extreme poverty you know the free food grain program giving money however little it is during the covid and the direct benefit transfer where no pilferage happens about the money which goes have all lifted 25 crore people out of extreme poverty it's a data given and poverty is not just one indicator based measurement it's not how much money i have in my pocket it's so much more have i got access to health without paying money without having to prove myself and without having to sell that little piece of land that i have or selling the goat that i own yes ayushman bharat 
have I got a house to live in or is it gone? Is it a thatched roof which will completely get washed away during rain? No, a pakka house. Is my wife or my mother or my daughter going miles to get drinking water? No, Jal Jeevan mission. Is my wife or mother or whoever is the member who is spending time in the kitchen affected because of the smoke? No, Ujjwala Yojana. So, if there are monies to be reaching you, whether it is Kisan, Samman Nidhi or pension, it reaches your account directly because you have a bank account. Now, those were zero balance accounts. Now, when monies go, I can't speak for A, B, C like that, but for all those who have PM Jandan account, today their total balance in their account has crossed 2,30,000 crores. 2,30,000 crores. Balance in PM Jandan accounts. What does that say? The poor are getting regular money coming little by little into their accounts. They are spending but keeping also some money in their own account. Are these not indicators? And similarly, the poor in India have never had any kind of financial assistance given to them for their businesses. A small tea shop owner, a small vegetable seller, a small, you know, street corner flower seller are all today benefiting from PM Swanidhi. Otherwise, did you think banks will entertain them going inside and saying, Saab, Panch Hazar, I want loan. They are all dependent on middlemen. I've lived in a small, very small town and I very clearly noticed because I used to go, I love going to the vegetable market, buying it and coming. I've heard some of the vegetable fellows tell us that every morning he'll go to the middleman, say today I want to buy my stock for my shop, I need thousand rupees. Even as he gives him the money, he will only give nine 900 rupees, 912, 920, something like that. But when he goes back in the evening after finishing his business, he'll have to pay back a thousand rupees. That is the kind of usurious interest these people took. Well, no, no one could do anything because at least they were available for them. Today, these small businesses get it from the bank. And the bank and such small um, traders, street vendors have developed a good relationship and I am happy to say many of these, why most of these accounts are being serviced very well. So that which person who was ready for uh, 10,000 today is going higher and says okay now he is eligible to get 20,000, the bank is convinced he is genuine. Sooner he gets out of Swanidhi and gets the mudra loan for himself. So, there is progression in terms of small businesses getting some loans to continue with their business. Are these not ways in which you empower a person to get out of poverty? Or is it by saying, every year I'll throw one lakh into his account, finish. One lakh will reach his account. But what happens to his health? What happens to the little credit he needs? What happens to the gas? His wife and children, everybody will be going miles to get water and maybe walking through hot sun. Are we bothered about them having a house? So, the perspective on poverty. I mean, there was a time when I thought Garibi Hatao is a magic word. Even today we hear the grandson of uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi telling us, yes, I have a magic wand. Why didn't Mrs. Gandhi get that magic wand? Poverty can be removed like that. But it takes a lot of effort. And that is why I think India, people who talk on poverty, should go see it for themselves. Should hear people who have lived in poverty as to how it is little by little bringing them out of it. And rather not sit in rooms from where they said, 
5% growth is only unimaginable. Let's see, you'll reach there. Today we are on 8. 8% growth. The last quarter's growth is still pending. I'm not the finance minister. I know media is sitting here. The finance minister said 24 growth is already 8%. The last quarter's growth numbers will have to still come. But it was 8 first quarter, 8 second quarter, 8.4 the third quarter. So it will average to that kind of a... So people who gave us advice to print money and give money in the hands of people during COVID and people who said only then Nyai will be done and people who told us 5% itself has, is unim unimaginable for India. Answers are being given by the people of India. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now we open the floor for the questions. Members, one request, keeping the time and effective utilization of her time, valuable time, we request you to ask the macro policy level questions. Don't get, on, get into the granular uh, questions. That's a request. Yeah. Now, I may request Padam Chan sir her to uh, ask his question right now. Madam, privilege hearing you. And I'm picking up certain points from your speech, concern, talking about technology, talking about digital transformation, talking about GIP City, talking about APES, and I'm therefore imagining India's position in the global scenario, where we are having a lot of attention being paid to the BEPS action plan, base erosion profit shifting. There is an action plan one, action plan two. India is also an active participant in that. The question for us is that the world is unified in terms of identifying the problems, but running helter-skelter in terms of the actual addressal of the problems concerned. We have the equalization levy here. We have the digital services tax elsewhere. So there is some sort of a disharmony in terms of the solutions. Now, it's bound that we are going to have some problems in terms of resolving these disputes concerned. But India is steadfastly saying, I'm not going to be a part of the arbitration that the international community is agreeing upon. So your thoughts on that, one. Two, India is bound to be the place where it's going to support the whole world because the technology and the Indian next population are going to be the supporters of the world concern. So when we therefore are looking and participating in the international trade barrier discussion, are we, should we necessarily keep in mind India's strength in terms of saying that hey, India is going to be the service provider to the whole world at large. And therefore when you are drafting policies, should be having this aspect in mind. Third would be the aspect of uh, the equalization levy that's coming in, possibly not gelling well with the action plan one and action plan two today. Where are we looking forward to this levy continuing in the next future? Well, uh, your second question is, of course, we keep the strengths of India in mind when negotiations happen for uh, agreement, trade agreement, services agreement um, with any country. So those discussions have been going on with UK, with Canada. We completed one with UAE. We completed one with Australia earlier. So yes, we do keep in mind. And uh, we want India with its uh, professional excellence and the soft skills that Indians have, we want uh, that benefit to accrue to us. On the two pillar solutions, it's all right, you recognize, I also recognize that at least now they've come to realize that the economies from where they make their profits don't get anything at all. Till now they've not received anything. India, like country, did their own version of bringing an equalization levy. But before the two uh, pillars are agreed upon, any attempt to remove this would deny India its sovereign right. But equally, we'll have to see how the pillar one solutions are, are getting arrived at. Pillar two solutions are also now, in many countries, there are discussions, some are not really comfortable with the kind of solution which is emerging. So that's some work to go on. 22 November, it seemed, October, it seemed like we could move faster. But I think the priorities of countries and the way in which they are looking at it is making uh, the process consume a lot more time to resolve. So that is the answer to your second question. What was your first? Arbitration. India is 
India is not agreeing for arbitration as a method of resolving disputes in No, we want our domestic laws to be given priority. Wherever there is a dispute, first of all, at least two years you try, if you don't get a resolution here, through India's commercial courts. We are setting up commercial courts. So I would ideally think, and the government's feeling is, that our own domestic courts should give their verdict on it. And beyond that, if there's a need, global. But right away taking Indian is, um, issues, commercial disputes, to an arbitration without even trying in our own laws, our own courts, is uh, unacceptable. Yeah. Madam, I, uh, it's an honor to address you. And uh, I appreciate you mentioning about uh, relying on taxpayers voluntary compliance and I'm speaking in the context of GST. If we peruse the tariff, the GST tariff, we'll find that uh, sectors where there is a slower, relatively slower adaptation to technology and uh, relatively uh, lesser documentation of their transactions, tariffs have been lower without the benefit of tax credits. But other businesses where audit is more readily possible, tariffs are higher and uh, cascading is eliminated. So as a result, what happens is uh, these sectors which are still to pick up the pace as far as their own compliance are concerned will see the effect of cascading of taxes. Is it possible for GST tariff to have options as far as allowing slower adapters to get the benefit of uh, simpler compliances and those who are able to adapt to technology better and faster relative to their peers to have the option of paying the higher tariff and enjoy tax credits which will eliminate uh, cascading of taxes and help them become more profitable. Your thoughts on that? Well, uh, the council will have to discuss it. It may not be just my thoughts. But equally, as you say, it sounds attractive, but how does one implement it? When, uh, when you give an option, that somebody who's uh, tax savvy can get into it, others can stay out of it, won't there be a arbitrage? So do companies have to choose from this or that? And in choosing, will the authorities be clear on who's choosing for what reason? One. Second, even this lower rate, less compliance burden, but no uh, tax credit is not decided by the council. The industry sectors themselves come and say, no, we don't want credit, please don't put us on it. Now, it's all right for us. I would be very impressed hearing you. I'll go change it. I'll have 10 groups sitting in North Block tomorrow. <laughs> Most often, decisions are taken after hearing the industry sectors, if they want it this way or that way. And finally, we think we've heard all of them, and therefore, we take a position. There is an 11th one who comes saying, no, you didn't consult me. I don't want it this way. So we need constantly to keep in touch with sectors and take them on board for any decision that we take in all these matters. Good evening, ma'am. I uh, wanted to pick up on the digital um, transaction, digital effort. India is a very robust, dynamic financial system with very fast moving transactions. Naturally, because we have the largest number of transactions, we are also the location where most cyber crime is happening. But globally also, cyber crime is evolving uh, at a very fast pace. Uh, are we looking at new enforcement, new regulation to uh, tackle this uh, forward looking? Um, yes, a lot of work is happening on it. I wouldn't be able to say whether it is in one particular direction or another. Cyber crimes are very seriously handled. There is a whole lot of agencies within the government who sit together and see where it is, what it is, what's the uh, uh, depth of it, what extent is it spreading, and so on. So it is addressed every now and then. There's no one solution for all. Madam, there is an acceleration in tax gathering. 
by the government after you came to this position as finance minister. This is everybody in our profession know very well. In fact, our professional fraternity will compliment you for that. But now, since uh, there is a kind of uh, business and the accounting, these are two interrelated aspects of business. If the reporting part is taking place, only after that the government of India knows what is the tax gathered, means tax collected by the business entity. Why can't it be made the other way that each and every moment there is a transaction taking place at the counter of the business, at least for bigger businesses. So this is automatically getting connected to some kind of a master uh, system to the nation where the government knows by itself because technology driven, technology is most advanced in India and there are people who can work on that, even our profession is always ready to do that. So if that has been, that is done, I am sure that at least 50% of the taxes, more than 50% of what the government is now gathering the taxes, this it will be definitely assured, this could be possible, a thought can be given. Good evening, madam. Thank you so much for addressing our chartered accountants. And uh, I'm sure we are going to touch 5 trillion economy very soon. And the uh, government of India is also working towards skill development and a lot of various incentives for MSMEs. My question here is that what is the future vision in terms of innovation and uh, reaching best productivity? Well, I think there's a lot of work happening in terms of innovation. Government is trying to support them. Anusandan Kosh, which is now announced in this vote on account budget, is also uh, for creating uh, that corpus which is necessary for giving support for research and also for risk taking in the private uh, domain for uh, greater innovation to happen. Normally, funds for the private sector wouldn't readily come in. Government has now created this. That body, let's say some kind of a special purpose vehicle, will have to handle it so that greater innovative activities are supported, um, high risk activities can be supported, and so on. So we are doing it through uh, this course, we are also trying to help uh, the uh, institutions like Indian Institute of Sciences, IIT and so on to handhold people who are undertaking such uh, research or some uh, specific innovative uh, steps in say their own domains and so on. So we are supportive of innovation. Uh, good evening ma'am and we have to, as professionals, congratulate you and compliment you for your faceless assessment scheme, uh, concurrently the faceless conferment of jurisdiction. And this is one uh, technological advancement that has been introduced into direct taxes. And uh, your PLI scheme, uh, which has started paying uh, uh, dividend now, I have a few, uh, we are eager to know as to what is your take on, uh, in so far as semiconductor business is concerned, would you be expanding scope of business trust to include uh, semiconductor activity? Would you be expanding scope of 115 BAB in respect thereof? We'd also be eager to know as to how would uh, you would uh, respond to Nestle's decision, you know, like on good faith doctrine, there is some fear that the decision uh, like contradicts the good faith doctrine in terms of the treaty uh, uh, interpretation of protocol notification. And lastly, the government's take on angel tax, 5627B tax, which uh, the industry is little worried about. Yeah, we are eager to know your uh, thought process on that. The angel tax matter is something on which we've spoken a lot. It's not the intent of the government to go taxing startups or anything. 
and that clause was not incidentally brought by us. It's been there since. It was brought in with an intent and we see an element of that being relevant even today. And uh, as a fallout of it also, the way in which shell companies were identified and a lot of uh, measures were taken to remove shell companies by MCA. So angel tax is a convenient point on which discussions can happen anywhere as though it is only aimed at one particular aspect of business or one particular section of business startups for instance no the understanding of what comes under angel tax is something which i've had quite a few discussions with people and there is no way in which you can otherwise handle shell company problems and I have in fact specifically asked, saying, tell me what is that one particular thing connected to angel tax, which you want us to do? I've never had one answer. Again, like many things, several answers. Simple one of which, accuse me for reductionist approach, making it sound very simple. Everything that happens in Singapore should happen here today. I'm simplifying the whole thing. I may be wrong. But it cannot be that we aspire to become like Germany or Singapore or some other country where other framework of law exists and also this would be part of it. So in India, I think what is important is to see how gradually a lot of loosening up is happening. If there is a hurtful content in terms of what comes under the broad category of angel tax is brought to my notice, I'm quite happy to handle it. It's not our in, uh, um, intent to make it stifling for startups, but yet it has to fall within some framework. So do I will invite you also to give me that which is specifically pinching. I'll address it. Spectral problem is being brought under one name, angel tax. This also, that also, that also, that also. Can't be that. Yeah, the question on business trust also. Ah, yeah, sorry. Well, that was a... It may not be government's take. It is a question of what is it which businesses declare. And from the point of view of health today, our expectations, so are many countries, almost most countries, expectation that things which have to be avoided will have to be said that be cautious, this has this much. So there is an ethical expectation from business to disclose. Was it adequately disclosed or not is the question about Nestle now. Yes, go on. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Um, I understand. I, I was addressing the sugar content in food. <laughs> that's right. Because uh, that's very important that businesses declare it. Yeah, on the Supreme Court, I think it's come out very openly. There's nothing more for me to add on that decision. can go ahead. <clears throat> Good evening, madam. As you initially started, <clears throat> sorry, I have a bad throat, that uh, during the independence time, many of the advocates moved out of the profession in support of it. Though I professionally chartered accountant, I moved into an organization where it imparts skill to the youth and get employment. We are there in existence for the last 50, 60 years, and we have delivered many, many students who have come out successfully, and all of them are placed at the end of the period of the three years diploma. Under the MSDE, there is an education skill loan is there. 
It is only limited to 1.5 lakhs, which was made about 15 years back. Today, the cost of living gone up. We have to take care of the teaching staff. So I made a request whether this 1.5 lakhs to be increased to 2.5 lakhs for the benefit of the economically weaker sector in society people to avail the loan and get the skill on hand and get the employment. Thereby, he contributes the skill in India with a nominal rate. The request has been made through MSDE. The notification was given by MSDE. That's one question. Second question, there was a fund called Technology Services Revolving Fund. It was signed in 1989 between Reconstruction and Development, International Bank Development Association and Government of India, where the fund was made available to such a technological institution at a very nominal rate of interest. It is 1% interest. We availed twice. First time, 5 crore, repaid the money. Second time, 25 crore, we repaid the money. Because the technology is keep on changing. So our tech students must also learn what is the current technology like uh, additive manufacturing, robotics, etc., like that. And as an organization, we are for a non-profit organization. So such funds was very helpful for modernize our shop floor, thereby the boys get the latest technical training for them to get the employment. That is number two question. Recently, our first private organization to get recognition under NCVET, which comes under MSDE. You are given exemption to all NCVET earlier before that, like ITI, no GST, nothing of that kind. So we want that also to be extended to the Recognize the organization of NCVET under the Government of India, MSDE. The last question. These so one question. Sorry. Only three? Yes, the positive time, sir. Okay, sorry. Your first question is a suggestion. I love to pass it on to the concerned ministry about the scholarship amount being increased. The second about a technology rotating fund, I'll have to go see whether yours is not getting, whether that is closed, whether there is a renegotiation or whatever. So I need to check up on that. I may not be on the top of it. Uh, the third which you said was about? GST exemption to the NCBT. Ah, all right. I'll have a look. I'll have to check it up with the council. Okay, we'll take one more, one last question, uh, considering the paucity of time. instigated the client to complain against me. The so this is not a forum to address that question. My apologies. So this is not the forum. So, so can you please take this up? It's a personal question. No, we are done with the time. We, Madam's time is enough time. I mean, she, is, uh, she has another meeting to attend. Ma'am, we have a small felicitation for you. We request you. No, no, please, please no, accept that. No felicitations. Okay. No felicitations. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. In that yeah. time, at least we can ask one question. Madam, just one question uh, regarding the income tax. That's it. Huh?